Hello, everybody. Welcome back to week four of our special study during the global COVID-19 virus crisis pandemic around the world. I'm Rick Warren, pastor of Saddleback Church, author of The Purpose Driven Life, and teacher for the Daily Hope broadcast. Now, in this series, it's my goal to share with you practical and biblical principles that'll help you navigate this crisis with your family, with stability, and with strength. You know, since I've been pastor of Saddleback Church for 40 years, this is our 34th national or international crisis that our church has been a part of, and we've taken leadership in many of those in encouraging others. So in many ways, our church was prepared for this because we've been through it so many other times, disasters, fires, floods, you know, uh, hurricanes, pandemics around the world as a part of our global peace plan. Now, while I can't physically protect you from getting the virus, I can help you be prepared for all the side effects of having your world turned upside down by this crisis. You know, this week we received more bad news and every day it seems the pandemic continued to grow around the world. We don't know how long it's gonna last, but God has not left us without hope and without help. And there's a book in the Bible called the book of James that was actually written to people who were under intense pressure and stress. And we're going to look at it in the weeks ahead. Now, the crisis that they were dealing with was actually persecution by the Roman Empire. But the bottom line was that everybody's life was turned upside down. And in this book, James deals with 14 or more implications of what do you do when your life's turned upside down. And he teaches us how God wants us to live when we're under severe stress or in times of great change. Four weeks ago, I started this new series called A Faith That Works When Life Doesn't a faith that works when life doesn't. If you're having a difficult time with anxiety, I really want to encourage you to go listen to the first message in this series that deals with anxiety. And if you're having a difficult time handling why all this is happening, I encourage you to listen to the second message in this series. And if you're having a hard time making some very tough decisions because you're out of work or your kids are at home from school and you're having to deal with that or you're isolated at home, I encourage you to listen to last week's message on a faith that makes tough choices easier. Now, this week, we're gonna look at something totally different. One of the things that happens when we're under stress is we start looking for coping strategies to ease our anxiety. And unfortunately, often those things make things worse. And James has a lot to say about this, these distractions, these disturbances, these temptations. And he gives us wise advice on how not to be tempted by our typical self-defeating behaviors that we tend to go to in times of stress, our bad habits, the things we often do to comfort ourselves, to self-soothe ourselves when we're anxious or fearful or worried. So today, we're gonna look at a faith that counters my bad habits, a faith that counters my bad habits. It's gonna be a very practical message and by the way, at the end, we're gonna take communion together. But let's begin by reading what James has to say about temptation. James chapter one, verses 13 to 16 says this. Never blame God when you're tempted because God can't be tempted by evil and he never tempts anyone to do the wrong thing. We are tempted by our own desires inside us. That's what drags us in the wrong direction and traps us our wrong desires lead us to wrong actions. And those sinful actions eventually end in death. In other words, it's a dead end. So he says, friends, don't be deceived by every desire you feel. Now, there's a lot of material on temptation we're gonna look at in this passage, but I wanna point out that God has not left us powerless to deal with the things that tend to drive us or distract us when we're under stress. 1 John chapter 5, verse 4 and 5 says this, Everyone who is a child of God can overcome sin. And that obviously includes the temptation to sin. Can overcome sin in this world. What wins the victory is our faith. That's why we're talking about a faith that works when life doesn't. What wins the victory is our faith. No one can defeat the world's ways without having faith in Jesus Christ as the son of God. In other words, willpower doesn't work long term. Now, what is that verse saying to us? Well, it's saying that on this earth, you're never gonna be sinless, but you can sin less. 
If you have a particular habit or a particular temptation or particular distraction that is your downfall and you tend to go back to it over and over every time you're under stress, you're probably going to have that the rest of your life. You're never going to have perfection on this side of eternity. But he says you can sin less. You can be less distracted. And I'm going to share with you from God's word nine counter moves. Now, each week I, I print up an outline uh, for this, and it's if you can got, uh, get to a computer at saddleback.com forward slash watch, saddleback.com, you can actually download uh, the teaching notes and, and fill in and, and take notes as we're going along. But here are the nine counter moves to keep you on track so that you don't fall in the same typical uh, temptations when you get under stress, when you're cooped up at home. Number one, first, I need to know I need to know my default coping strategy. You need to know and recognize what's the typical way you stumble. I need to know my default coping strategy. Hebrews 12 one says this, we should remove from our lives anything that gets in the way. He's talking about in the way of our spiritual growth, especially those, circle this, persistent sins that so easily distract us. Other translations call it the besetting sins. What he's talking about. Each of us tend to fall in a certain area over and over and over and over in our lives. And we keep going, why do I do that? That's the persistent sin. That's the distraction. That's your default coping mechanism or strategy. Now, temptation, what is it? Temptation is always a distraction. It's the distraction to do something less uh, uh, than something better to do something wrong than to do something right, to do something that's actually self-defeating than something that is uh, self-building and making you more the kind of man or woman that God wants you to be. Now, let's talk about this. For instance, when we get under stress, uh, we all resort to different coping strategies. Some of us resort to food, okay? And we tend to eat more when we're under stress. Uh, in other words, to cope or to soothe or to relieve stress. Others of us resort to drinking. Others of us resort to sleeping more, and, and you end up spending more time in bed. Some of you, when you get under stress, you resort to shopping. And if you're at home and online shopping is available, you can spend a lot of money uh, that you don't have on things you don't need during this crisis. Some of us when we're under stress, do binge TV, and we watch hour after hour after hour. You, you, your, your predictable uh, area of comfort might be video gaming, and you're spending hour after hour on that. You can get addicted to that like you can do anything else, you, to drugs, to gambling, uh, to pornography. Some people turn to porn when they're under stress. Other people, they turn to over-controlling, and, and, and the more they feel their life is out of control, the more controlling they become, and that becomes an irritation to everybody else in the family or in the business. Other people do the opposite, and they withdraw, and they pull back into shell, which is just as wrong. Other people, when they're under stress, they fall into the trap of angry outburst and maybe even domestic violence that might increase if we don't know how to deal with this. So I need to first know my predictable area of failure, where I tend to fall, where what's my default coping device. Second, write this down, I need to know my emotional triggers. If you're gonna overcome the things that keep causing you to stumble, you need to know the emotional triggers those are the things that make you vulnerable to your particular temptation. I want you to listen closely. A key to defeating temptation is don't focus on your behavior that you don't like. Okay, don't focus on the actions, on your activity, on your behavior. Instead, focus on what you're feeling and what you're thinking that's causing those actions. Every action is caused by an emotion and every emotion is caused by a thought. If you want to change the way you act, you got to change the way you feel. And if you want to change the way you feel, you got to change the way you think. It all starts in your brain. Now, Satan plays on your emotions. And that's, and of course, 
Advertisers know this. They plan on your emotions. They know what will manipulate you. Uh, uh, Satan loves to hook your feelings. He's a master manipulator of your moods. By the way, do you know what the most common foothold uh, Satan uses in your life to get your attention? Negative emotions. Negative emotions give Satan a foothold in your life. And that's why the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, above all else, guard your heart. Guard your heart, for it affects everything you do. Now, in the Bible, the heart is a metaphor for the center of your emotions, okay? And we, we, you know, even though we know emotions are in your brain, we still say, I love you with all my heart, and, and I have a heart for this and a heart for that. We're talking about your passions, your emotions. And, and you are far more vulnerable to temptation when you are in certain emotional states and you're less vulnerable to temptation when you're in other emotional states. Now, these differ from people to people. So there on your outline, I've made a brief list, and I'd like for you to circle which of those uh, uh, you say, that's me, that when I'm feeling that way, I'm vulnerable to my default coping strategy. I'm vulnerable to the bad habits in my life. When are you most tempted? This is the question that answers when. For most people, uh, temptation goes up when we're physically exhausted. When you're physically exhausted, you're, you're more tempted in a lot of different areas. And that's why during this COVID-19 crisis, you got to make sure you get your sleep, you eat right, you exercise, that, that you don't wear yourself out. If you're at home seven days a week, it would be easy to work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. And, and, uh, and to wear yourself out. When you're, the more exhausted you are, the more you're a plaything for, for Satan. He can tempt you in all kinds of areas. Others uh, get uh, uh, tempted when they're discouraged. Maybe when you're discouraged or pessimistic, that's when you're more tempted to your default uh, temptation. Maybe it's when you're bored or, or maybe when you're discontented and you're sitting around at home and you go, I'm just, I've got cabin fever. And then you give in to a temptation. Or maybe it's when you're spiritually dry or you're empty. Or some people, they, they're most tempted in an area that's unhelpful and unhealthy to them when they're lonely or when they're disconnected, when you're insecure or you're unsure, when you're wounded or you're hurt. If you're holding on to a grudge, if you're resentful, you are a prime candidate for being knocked over by some kind of temptation. You can have sadness be a foothold in your life or grieving, a loss. And of course, during this COVID virus, many people are losing a lot of things. People are losing their jobs. People are losing their retirement. People are losing family members. There's a lot of loss. And in that loss, there is no loss without grief. Just be aware that when you're grieving and in loss, you're more vulnerable. So I first need to know my default coping strategy. Where do I tend to stumble when I'm under stress? And then I need to know my emotional triggers. Why do I tend to stumble? What causes me to be triggered? Now, here's the third thing you need to, to know. I need to learn my patterns, okay? I need to know my default. I need to know my triggers. I need to learn my patterns. What kind of patterns? Your patterns of temptation. Each of us have a unique pattern of temptation. Just like you have a unique f fingerprint, you have a unique voice print, you have a neat, unique heartbeat, you have a unique eye print, you are unique in many, many different ways uh, uh, of, your, of your life. That you're, no two snowflakes are alike, no two human beings are alike. Even identical twins are different. You also have a unique susceptibility to certain temptations that don't bother other people. And your spouse isn't maybe bothered by that, but you are. There are certain situations that tempt you and others don't. And, and the devil knows exactly what your pattern is, so you better know your pattern. Now, if you can identify your pattern, then you can predict those problems in advance and you can avoid those situations. You need to know what tempts me, you need to know why I'm tempted, and you know need to know when and where and all the other details. Proverbs 14 verse 8 says this, the wise man looks ahead. The fool tries to fool himself and he won't face 
the facts. Look ahead. We don't know how long this COVID-19 virus pandemic is going to last. We just don't know. Uh, but we do are told to look ahead so that we don't wear ourselves out, so that we know when temptations are coming. Foolish people rationalize. That means they tell rational lies. That means they try to justify with their mind what they know in their heart is wrong. But mature people are self-aware of their patterns. So let me give you five questions. Write these down to ask yourself about your patterns. First question to ask is, when am I most tempted? Ask yourself that question. When am I most tempted? And then do a little self-evaluation. Which day of the week? Am I more tempted on a Friday? Or am I more tempted on, tempted on a Monday? Or Saturday or Sunday? What time of day? Am I tempted more in the morning? Or am I tempted more at lunch? Or early evening? Or late evening? Or after everybody else is in bed? When I am, am I most tempted? You know, I've always said I can handle any diet until noon. Uh, and the, the fact is we're tempted at different times of the day. Number two, ask yourself where? Where am I most tempted? Am I most tempted at work? Am I most tempted in the kitchen? Am I most tempted sitting in front of a computer? And I'm, am I more tempted in front of the television? You know, right now most of us are, are isolated at home, but you could be tempted at your neighbor's house. You could be tempted at 7-Eleven, at a sports bar. You could be tempted at a beach. It doesn't matter. You just need to know where you're most tempted. And my advice to you is, if that's a problem for you, avoid those places. If you don't want to get stung, stay away from the bees. You don't go to the bar to eat pretzels if you have a difficult time, uh, you know, controlling your drinking. So when am I most tempted? Where am I most tempted? You want to ask the question, who is with me? when I'm most tempted? Now, this is an important question. Are you most tempted when you're alone? Are you most tempted when you're isolated at home by yourself? Are you most tempted when you're with a group of friends or with coworkers? Are you most tempted when you're with a crowd of strangers? Are you most tempted to get angry with your family? You need to know who am I around. You need to know these things. Number four, what temporary benefit do I get when I give in to temptation? When I give in to anger, when I give in to food, when I give in to pornography, when I give in to controlling, when I give in to fear, when I give in to worry, when I, I, I give in to, what do I get when I give in to drinking? Do I get more comfort? Do I get more relief? Does it bring me excitement? Does it bring me false confidence? The Bible says in Hebrews 11, 25, there's pleasure in sin. If sin wasn't pleasure, nobody would do it. If, pleasure, if sin was painful, nobody would do it. There, there, so what's the payoff? What's the payoff when I do this self-defeating behavior? And then number five, how do I feel right before I'm tempted? This is a good question to ask, to, to do your TQ, your temptation quotient. Uh, am I... Am I most tempted when I get frustrated, when I'm scared, when I'm bored, when I'm angry, when I'm lonely? Am I most tempted when I can't sleep? It's very important to know your emotional triggers, what makes you vulnerable. Now, once you know your answers to number one, number two, and number three, here's the fourth step. Plan to avoid those situations. Duh. <laughs> and plan to avoid those situations. Proverbs 4, 26 and 27. Plan carefully what you do. Avoid evil and walk straight ahead. Don't go one step off to the right, off the right way. In other words, if I know in that situation I'm going to be tempted to get angry, to exaggerate, to lie, to control, to uh, be resentful, to be jealous, to be envious. If I know in those situations all these negative emotions are going to come out, well, it's a pretty good idea to avoid them if possible, where it can. Okay? Uh, if you're trying to diet, uh, you, you don't go and sit and do your homework, uh, you know, in an ice cream uh, parlor or whatever tends to, you know, Mexican food or whatever. 
you would carry healthy snacks with you. That's planning in advance. You're going to the county fair and, and, and you're going to eat fried everything and that's going to kill your diet. No, you need to plan in advance. Okay. If you struggle uh, with controlling alcohol, you don't go to a bar to watch the game. Uh, maybe uh, you, you avoid airport bookstores. Maybe you need to block some channels on your TV and on your internet and on your phone. Now, sometimes you're going to get hit out of the blue. Despite the best plans, you plan to avoid the temptation. But sometimes you're in an emergency situation and you get hit out of the blue. And that's when you need emergency tactics to keep you from falling to your default self-defeating behavior. And that's the next thing, okay? You ask God for help. That's the next step. Number five, ask God for help. He's willing, he's waiting, he's wanting to help you. Now, sometimes you just have to pray a microwave prayer. It's not a long conversation. What's a microwave prayer? It's one word, help, <laughs> help, mayday, SOS, Danger, Will Rogers. You know, uh, get, 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 God, I need help right now. Now, the Bible is literally full of examples uh, of people like David and Daniel and Peter and Paul who prayed those microwave prayers, one way prayers. God, I need help right now. I am being tempted. Psalm 50, verse 15. Look at this verse. Call to me when trouble comes, and I will save you. Call to me. And, and that call is sometimes literally a cry. It's a help, cry for help. Help, God, I need help. That's an emergency tactic. Yeah, you need to plan to avoid temptation, but sometimes it comes out of left field. Now, why can I expect God to help me? Because he's sympathetic to your situation. Look at this verse, Hebrews chapter four, verse 15 and 16. Jesus says, the Bible says, Jesus understands our weaknesses. That means our default negative behavior our default, you know, way of coping with stress. He understands our weaknesses, for he faced the same temptations we do. Did you know that Jesus was tempted? In all points like as we, the Bible says, yet he did not sin. He was tempted, was Jesus ever tempted to be discouraged? Yes. Was Jesus ever tempted to be prideful? Yes. Was Jesus ever tempted to retaliate? Yes. Was Jesus ever tempted sexually? Yes. But the Bible says, that we come to him because he knew how to overcome it. He faced the same temptation we do, yet he did not sin. He did not sin. So, it says, because he's, he's been successful at overcoming the default behaviors of humanity. He says, let us overcome, let us come boldly to our gracious God, and there we will receive his mercy and grace to help us when we need it. Did you notice it said, same temptation. That's what I was just saying. Did Jesus ever struggle with loneliness? Yes. Fatigue? Yes. Anger? Yes. He was God, but he was fully in a human body, so he had our same kind of temptations. All right, let's go on to number six. Here's a really big key to, to breaking patterns in your life when you're under stress. Number six, refocus my attention on something else. When you're tempted by anything, you're at home during the COVID-19 crisis and you're being tempted in this area or that area or this area or that area, this is the key. Refocus your attention on something else. Don't fight the temptation, just change your focus. It's like if you're watching something on TV and you don't like what you see on the channel, you don't say, I'm not gonna watch this, I'm not gonna watch this, I'm not gonna watch this. You just hit the remote and change the channel. Uh, the reason we are easily defeated by temptation, you want to know why? Is because we try to resist it instead of refocusing. S don't try to resist the temptation. What you resist persists. The more you think about something, the more you're attracted to it. I'm not going to smoke that cigarette. I'm not going to eat that food. I'm not going to drink uh, that beer. I'm not going to watch that porn. The more you you you're resisting, you're driving the nail deeper. You just need to change your focus, get your mind on something else. The secret of defeating temptation is not fighting it. The secret of temptation is simply thinking about something else. Get interested in something else. Whatever you resist, persist. Don't resist, refocus. 
Change your attention. Change the channel of your mind. The Bible says it like this in Romans 12, 21. Don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil. How? With good. This is the principle of replacement, not resistance. You don't resist evil, you replace it. You don't resist temptation, you replace it, you refocus. If your mind is filled with good thoughts, there's no room for tempting ones, okay? Now remember, temptation always starts with a thought. It, it, James 1.15 says it starts by getting your attention. And, and if, if, if Satan can't get your attention, you can't be tempted. So uh, he gets your attention. Advertisers do this. They hook your attention. And then they move from attention to arousal. And that's when your emotion kicks in. And then it moves from attention to arousal to action, and you end up acting on it. So whatever gets your attention gets you. You know, if I were to say, hey, are you hungry right now? We haven't been thinking about it, but if I say, are you hungry now? You go, well, Rick, to think of it, I mentioned I, mentioned I am a little hungry. Are, are, are you cold right now? Well, now that you mentioned, I, I am a little cold in here. Let me ask this. <sighs> are you tired right now? <sighs> Well, now, now that you mention it, yeah, whatever gets your attention gets you. The more you think about something, the stronger hold it gets on you. When people say, I'm really, really upset by this. Well, do you want to be? You don't have to be. That's a choice. You're choosing to think about upsetting thoughts. You don't have to choose to think those upsetting thoughts. Nobody's holding a gun to your head. See, the more you fight a feeling, the more it controls you. You might write this down. The more you fight a feeling, the more it controls you. The key is not to fight it or to resist it, but to ignore it and to refocus and replace it. And when you ignore it and refocus and replace it, you weaken it. This is what the Bible means in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, where it says, We capture every thought and we make it obey Christ. Now, that's not easy to do when you first start out. It takes practice, but you can get good at it. You can learn how to control your thoughts. Some people have never, ever even tried to control their thoughts. Their, their brain is so, they're so open-minded, their brains fall out, and they'll let anything just go through their mind. They, they worry about, you know, uh, you know, pollution, water pollution, and they worry about food pollution, but they don't worry about mind pollution. Everything you allow in your mind, every song, every movie, every video, every thought, every, it's all going back in there. It's getting stored. And, and you're not bringing your thoughts under control. That's what it means to be a mature person. Now, when you have a temptation, you can't stop Satan from putting thoughts in your mind, but you can reject them and change your mind. Martin Luther said, you can't stop a bird from flying over your head, but you can stop them from making a nest in your hair. So what does that mean? Is you don't dwell on the thought. If a thought comes into your mind, have you ever been praying? You go, wow, where'd that weird, that ugly, that awful, that horrible thought come from? While I was praying, well, I can tell you where it came from. Satan, put it in your mind. When you get a thought from God, it's called inspiration. When you get a thought from the devil, it's called temptation. When you get a thought from yourself, it's just your own thought but you can get thoughts from three different areas. And you don't have to receive or uh, any of these thoughts. You can choose to reject the thoughts that God gives you. You can choose to reject the thoughts that the devil gives you. And let me give you this. You have permission to not believe everything you tell yourself because not everything you tell yourself is true. But don't ever try to argue with the devil. When, when he puts a thought in your mind and says, no, no, I don't believe that. I don't feel that way. I don't feel that way. He's got you hooked. When, don't try to argue with the devil. He's better at arguing than you are. But when Satan calls, when temptation calls, drop the receiver, okay? Here's the next thing you need to do. I think this is point six. Join a small group for support. You knew I'd get to this. Why? Because you weren't meant to fight your battles all by yourself. We're better together. God wired us to need each other. At Saddleback, we say small groups are the church. Now, this message that I'm sharing, we originally uh, were just, I was making these messages for my own congregation. 
but there are a lot of churches around the world who don't have the capability of creating an online service. So we're letting a lot of churches use these as their weekend worship services uh, until, um, uh, until this crisis is over. Then you'll go back and you'll have your own services. But we willingly and gladly share these services with you. But the Bible does say that it's important to get together. Hebrews 10, 25, let us not give up the habit of meeting together as some are doing. Instead, let us encourage each other all the more. Now, notice there that the purpose of getting together is to encourage each other all the more. Well, you say, Rick, how do we do this when we're all in lockdown or we're all stay at home uh, or, or we're all supposed to isolate ourselves and we're not supposed to get together for worship service? Well, you can, you can do it online. You can learn. Saddleback Church, um, ha, when we started uh, this year, we had 6,000 small groups that were meeting in 197, uh, uh, 97, 198 cities of Southern California uh, and also overseas in, on four continents. Uh, we actually have more people in our church in small groups than actually came on the weekend. About 30,000 would come on the weekend, about 45,000 people in these 6,000 small groups. But during this COVID virus, since this started, we have started over 3,000 new small groups at Saddleback Church. I didn't know any other way to do this. We've started 3,000 new groups since the crisis began. This week, we started 129, I believe, new groups. Well, are they meeting together? No, they're meeting online. And we're using Zoom, and we're using Microsoft uh, Team, and we're using uh, uh, you know, Skype, and we're using uh, you know, the FaceTime on your phones and different things like that. Now, if you're not in a small group during this crisis, friend, you're vulnerable. Can I help you? Can I help you get into a small group? Here's what you do. I don't care where you live in the world. If you will text me, if you're in America, you can text small group, just word, one word, small, S-M-A-L-L-G-R-U-P. Text small group to 99,000. Small group to 99,000. I'll help you get in a group. Right now it's taking us about two days to get people connected uh, to, to a small group. Uh, and we'll be glad to help you get in a, in a small group. If you're overseas and you're watching or listening to this, you can email. Email smallgroup at saddleback.com. Smallgroup at saddleback.com. We'll get you in a group no matter where you are in the world. All right? Let me give you two more practical steps to defeat the typical ways you stumble when you get under stress. Number eight, enlist one friend to share my struggle. Enlist one friend to share my struggle. You will not have victory over your persistent temptation, the one that you've kept falling for over and over and over. Fear, anxiety, worry, uh, guilt, low self-esteem, anorexia. Uh, I don't care what it is. Uh, whether you're not going to have victory by yourself. This is a bad, if it's a persistent sin in your life, you can't win it on your own. That's why you need at least one person. Now, let me give you an important verse. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9 and 10 says this, two are better than one because together, if one falls down, the other can help him up. But if someone is alone and falls, there's no one else to help him. Who's helping you? Let me ask you, while you're isolating during this time, who's checking up on you? Or let me ask you, who have you invited to check up on you? Who have you invited to help you grow? Who are you checking up on? Who do you allow to ask you the tough questions? You don't have to tell everybody about your secret temptation, but you do have to tell somebody. Many times people will come to me and say, Pastor Rick, I've never told this to anybody before. And I get very excited, not for my benefit, but because I know that that's the first step to freedom. Revealing your feeling is the beginning of healing. So let me just ask you very, you know, very frankly, how serious are you about changing? Do you want to waste this period of time we're in this COVID-19 shutdown? Or do you want to come out of this pandemic a better 
person. You don't want to be bitter. You want to be better. Are you seriously enough to engage the help of a friend for accountability. You can do that online. You can do that through texting, through email, from the good old fashioned phone. You, you can do it uh, in Skype. You can do it in social media in a, in a private area. If you're not willing to be accountable for the biggest area you keep stumbling in, quit kidding yourself. You really don't want to change. You, you don't really want to change. We never change until the fear of change is exceeded by the pain. Now, I want to tell you this. There are some habits and some problems in your life you're just not going to get over until you share them with a committed friend. You don't even have to tell the whole small group, but just find one person. Galatians 6.2 says this, by helping each other with your troubles, you can truly obey the law of Christ. And one of my goals during this time, these unfortunate and unusual times where we're not able to meet as churches and we're not, kids are home from school and we're not working, this is a time to work on you. And so find a small group, help, let us help you get a small group and find one person that you can get real with. All right? I'm going to be praying for you. Let me give you one more. Number nine. This is a nine counter move, ninth counter move. Remember, remember that God is on my side. God wants you to win over temptation. He wants you to win over temptation. First Corinthians 10, 13 says this. When temptations come into your life, remember that they're no different from what others commonly experience. In other words, we all have the same temptations. Now, common temptations means they're common solutions. And it says, God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. That's a promise from God. So when somebody says, I couldn't help myself, well then, you weren't letting God help you. Because God says, I'll never let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. He says, also when you're tempted, he will show you a way out so you will be able to withstand it. That is a promise of God. I want to encourage you to write that verse down, memorize it during this COVID-19 crisis. And then we go back to James, this practical book that we're looking at from week to week. James chapter 1 verse 12 says this, God blesses people who continue strong. That means they persevere, they endure. God blesses people who continue strong when they are tempted. They will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. I don't even know what is all included in the crown of life, but it's got to be good. It's got to be good. Now, this is part of the good news of Jesus Christ. This next week, uh, in many places around the world, we'll all be celebrating Easter. What is the message of Easter? That change is possible. This week, I want you to think about this. This is possible. Change is possible. You don't have to stay the same. You don't have to stay the same. It's never too late to start over. And even in the middle of this uncertain and unusual time of a coronavirus crisis, God has promised to help. Now today, before we end, I'm going to lead you uh, in, in communion. But first, we do three things in every worship service at our church, Saddleback, and I want to encourage you to do these same three things, okay? Number one, first, we recommit our lives to Jesus at the end of every service. So let's pause right now, and would you bow your head? And I'm going to lead a prayer, and you can pray this prayer in your heart. It's the first thing we do at the end of every service together. Would you say this in your heart? You don't have to say it aloud. God knows your thought. But if you're by yourself, why not say it aloud? Just say this, dear God, just say that. If you're by yourself, say it aloud. Dear God, you know all the habits and temptations in my life that have tripped me up for years. You know the tempting situations I'm facing right now. You know what temptations lay ahead of me this next week. 
So Jesus, I'm asking for your help. I am willing to follow your principles so I can change and I can be free and I can be different coming out of this crisis. Help me to clearly see the patterns in my life that lead to temptation and give me the strength to start avoiding them. Help me to remember to focus and refocus my attention on other things when I'm tempted. Today, Jesus, I commit to finding a small group where I can be encouraged and I can help others too. But most important, I need you to do some heart surgery on me. Remove the negative emotions, the fear, the worry, the anxiety, the insecurity that make me vulnerable to temptation. And replace these with your love and your forgiveness and your trust. I ask you, Jesus Christ, to start changing me from the inside out, beginning today. Thank you. I pray this humbly in your name. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer for the very first time and you opened your life to Jesus Christ, you need to tell somebody. So why don't you tell me? If you'll pick up your phone right now and text New Start, one word, N-E-W-S-T-A-R-T, New Start to 99,000. I can send you some material that'll help you with your decision. If you are listening to this outside of America, you can email me, newstart at saddleback.com, and I will send you some material that'll help you begin growing in your new faith. Congratulations. That's the first thing we do every week, is give our lives again to, to God. The second thing we do every week in worship is we express our gratitude to God through giving. We give back to God something that he's given to us. Now, you can't go to a service and give in an offering plate, but you could mail your church an offering. If you go to a different church, mail your church an offering. If you don't have a church home, you can give to saddleback.com. You can go online to saddleback.com slash give. You can sign up there and give online. We are feeding and caring for literally tens of thousands of people during this crisis. And we're working, we have, what, I think 12 different food banks. If you wanna help out, your gift can be used to help all the ministries that Saddleback is doing during this crisis. The third thing we do is we meet in our church family in small groups for support. If you are in a small group, go to your small group, get online with them, if you're not in a small group, would you text me, text small group, that's one word, S-M-A-L-L-G-R-O-U-P, small group to 99,000. If you're outside of America, you can, you can write to me, small group at saddleback.com, email small group at saddleback.com. And by the way, if you have a prayer request, we take prayer seriously in this church. We will pray for whatever request you send us, but we can't pray for you if you don't tell us. So if you wanna send a prayer request, you can text prayer, the word prayer, to 99,000, prayer to 99,000, or you can email prayer at saddleback.com. Now, we're going to uh, prepare for communion, and if you have not gotten uh, your, your juice or or uh, your wine or your bread or your uh, cracker together. I want you to go get that right now. I want you to listen to this song in preparation for communion. Then I'm gonna come back and lead you in communion and pray a prayer of blessing over you. All right, welcome back. You know, Jesus, uh, on the night he was betrayed, took bread and he blessed it and he said, this is my body which is given for you, do this to remember me. As we take this uh, together, 
I, I want you to, as you eat this bread or this wafer, I want you to thank God for the cross. Say, Jesus, thank you for dying for all my sins as we take this bread. Jesus Christ, we cannot thank you enough for what you've done for us. The fact that you paid for our sins when you were sinless, that you died for us to make possible heaven. And today we eat this bread to remember your great sacrifice. Jesus, thank you. Thank you so much that the Bible says God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. And Lord, even today, as we take this communion, there are some who are saying to you for the very first time, thank you for dying for me. I'm accepting my salvation that you have given to me by paying for it on the cross. We love you and we honor you in Jesus' name, amen. The Bible says that on the same night, Jesus took the cup of the covenant and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood and I want you to drink this to remember me. And as we drink this together, literally all over the United States, and literally all over the world together. This is a global communion we're doing together. You are connected to the body of Christ all around the world at this moment. And as we drink this cup, I want you to thank God for his grace and for his mercy and say, Jesus Christ, thank you for your grace and mercy. Jesus, we can't even imagine how much that you love us, that you'll never stop loving us, and that your love was so great that you were willing to die for us. May we have that kind of love for you and for others. And together as the body of Christ, the family of God, the children of God, together may our light shine during these dark days of the COVID-19 virus. And may we represent your love. Help us to treat everybody the way you would, Jesus. We humbly ask this in your name. Amen. Now, this next week is the most important week of the year. It's Easter week. It's Holy Week. Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter services on Sunday. For the first time in 2,000 years, the Christian church will not be able to gather in most places around the world because of this COVID-19 virus. But Easter has not been canceled. We're gonna celebrate it. We're gonna celebrate it online together. And I have prepared what I think is the most important Easter message I've ever shared in 40 years as a pastor. I want you this week to tell as many people as you can to join us with Easter services. We're going to begin broadcasting those Easter services from Wednesday on all of this next week, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, because we want everybody to hear the hope of the resurrection. In a time when so many people are dying from this pandemic, we have the greatest hope Yet he died, he shall live again. We have the promise of the resurrection. So tell everybody to join us this next week on our services. God bless you and write to us so we can stay in contact with you.